Hello and welcome back everyone uh, to the Vintage Super League quarterfinals. So I am Cyrus Corman Gill and I'm here with Andy Probasco. How's it going, Andy? It's going good. I mean, I guess we both just lost, but other than that, it's going good. How are you? Yeah, do, doing great. I mean, no one likes to lose, but what's great about Vintage is it, it gets fun to, it's fun even when you lose sometimes. Uh, lots of exciting decks and lots of great people. So we have Andy Marketin Montolio on Blitz Shot playing against Andreas Peterson on Five Color Legends. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not necessarily a traditional matchup because I don't think anyone knows their matchup against Five Color Legends, the same way that no one really knows their matchup against Jund. What do you think about this matchup, though, as a master of unconventional decks in <laughs> I don't, I don't know the master, but I'll take it. Um, you know, I, like you said, it's really hard to tell. I don't have a lot to base it on. I kind of like shops. Um, I just think it's got a lot of raw power and um, the mana is not so great. I mean, any deck that starts with five color, the mana is going to be tricky. Um, but I, the, Andre certainly has the tools tools to win right it's not like it's not like he has no good cards yeah it's vintage both players are playing a lot of a lot of really good cards and you know the sideboard is really going to come into play here with the four energy flux mm -hmm. uh which is a two and a blue enchantment is it originally what it says originally from i think antiquities antiquities yeah and there's reprinted in, in urza's uh urza's something like, one of yeah the uh so that's the one i have the art for here or it was reprinted in, in masks i think so at the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice this artifact unless you pay two is the text on that card. So that card is obviously good against the deck that is entirely that's, made of artifacts. All artifacts, too. too. Yes. I mean, every artifact gains that. So, yeah, as you were saying, it it, it can do a lot of damage. And uh, Mistress Workshop can't pay for that because Mistress Workshop casts artifact spells, but it does not pay for energy fluxes. It doesn't pay for artifacts' abilities, which is <laughs> what the artifact has on our energy flux. That is an ability that says at the beginning of your upkeep, you need to pay two. Yeah, it'll be it'll be really interesting to see uh, if that comes into play. Uh, Flux is sort of I've had a love hate relationship with it. It's it's one of the most powerful effects you can get down against workshops, but at the same time, it costs three mana. That's a lot against a workshop deck if they get wastelands and spheres. And there's a lot of things that uh, Andy could do, and and he knows how to do them against an energy flux that energy flux might look like it wipes out their board. But you can use an Arcbound Ravager and throw 20 counters on one creature and just pay two mana to save that one creature. Um, and sometimes that is enough. Uh, you can throw your counters on a Mishra's Factory and just survive. And if he happens to have Talarian Academy, it's a lot easier to pay for everything. Yeah, it just won't matter. And it, I think the big dynamic here is that Andreas's mana on his deck is not great. He's playing five colors. Uh, and he has also zero basic lands, which is a bold move with any marketing in your group, I would say. But he, not only does he have zero basic lands, he's playing a wasteland and a strip line. So he's really going to be relying on these Deathrite Shaman to mm -hmm. enable his deck. So I think that's going to be the key card in this matchup is can Andreas find a Deathrite Shaman to stay in the game? And can Montolio remove the Deathrite Shaman using something like Walking Ballista to, and to make his strip mine and his wastelands more effective? Yeah, I think you're right. I think the death rate's gonna be gonna be huge. So you played an interesting deck tonight, Jund, uh, Chubby Jund. Do you want to talk about what went into your decision to choose this deck? Sure. So uh, the name Chubby Jund comes from the vintage player uh, Matt Murray, who goes by the username Chubby Rain. Uh, he's been playing this uh, or, or something very similar to this list for a little while with a lot of success on Magic Online. Uh, I actually, uh, actually had to work on this deck without reaching out to him because he is a he is a testing partner of both Andy Markadan and and Rich Shea and a bunch of other people that are going to be in my opponents possibly coming up. So I had to secretly work on his deck without him. Uh, I, I, as should be obvious by now, I like playing things that are a little different, especially on the VSL uh, where we can showcase different decks. Uh, but I did feel like. It just has all these tools for workshops, and I knew we were going to see a workshop deck. And uh, the Cinderveins main my deck, and I wasn't sure if you were going to be on Paradox Glaucom or Storm, but I knew you were going to be casting, trying to cast ten spells in a turn. <laughs> I didn't that know was exactly. what I'm for. So yeah, I don't know which ten spells, but I knew you were going to be casting ten spells. So I knew that the Cinderveins and the Null Rod and would be um, would be decent choices. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, and it's a sweet deck. It's getting to play some new cards, getting to play some old cards, obviously, and it's a uh... 
like you said, it's something it's, it's showcasing what vintage is about. And that's one thing that's great about tonight is we have four very different decks doing very different things and just showcasing what makes vintage so great. So, all right, looks like we're going to get into the match now. Right. We have uh, opening hands. Looks like uh, Andreas is going to be on the play. And that's uh, what you're talking about with the Death Rite Shaman. Actually, it's a tough hand, right? Uh, two hands and a mox and a Death Rite's nice. Two mental missteps is not so nice. Yeah, I, I think that you need to mulligan this hand. Uh, mental misstep is just too bad against Workshop. There's only one target in Soul Ring. Uh, and I think Andre's gonna be going to five here. Oh, he's gonna keep and hope that hope that he fades his fear of resistance from Andy, which he does <laughs> yeah, not. Is a uh, I don't hate the keep, but it's obviously very very risky, and it would have paid off. It still has a chance to. Yeah, I actually respect this. I mean, I think that against so the mana denial deck, you can't really realistically expect to win a lot of games when you're going to five cards. Uh, the problem here is that Andy does have or Montolio does have the Firexion Revoker to name Black Lotus. This is kind of the one-two punch. It's really tough. It's a sphere resistance you, so you play out the artifact you have in hand because you need to because it costs one mana. It doesn't cost zero. And then they Hurricane Revoker, which is a really common play pattern from these Mistress Workshop decks. Yeah, Revoker is just such a good utility player. Yeah, looks like <laughs> Andy's going to be able to get three spheres down here. Uh, so I think that that plus a double, double factory is going to make pretty quick work of Andres' life total. And, and notably, Andres also had... Dak Faden, which is you know probably his best card in this matchup, uh, and as well as a time walk. So Dak Faden can steal an artifact, which is really good when your opponent's playing all artifacts. So you can take their creature, makes it hard for them to attack, while also giving you a blocker. So it just kind of it's it's just at its best in this matchup, and it discards your bad cards like Mental Misstep. But I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's not working out for him this time. But but I agree, Dak Faden is uh, it was kind of a turning point when it was printed. Um, it's it's rare that you have a card that it looks like it's one of my favorite designed cards for vintage because it's uh, it's both this hyper focused hate card like an energy flux but at the same time you main deck it you love to draw it against control decks it's so versatile um, and it's uh, kind of a, a hoser without without making the games feel bad I guess um, yeah and it really gets a shine in vintage. Uh... Because it doesn't, it doesn't really see as much play in any other format. Obviously, it's not modern legal. It was never standard legal. It was printed in, in Conspiracy. Uh, so it's legal in Legacy. It's legal in Vintage. It's legal in uh, Commander. But it really gets a shine in this format where it's a, it's an all-star. It, it defines the Xerox decks for the most part. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. So yeah. what's nice about these Mishra's Workshop decks is uh, I know that Montolio doesn't necessarily like how long Paradox of Outcome takes to win because it's so boring to watch, but there's just a lot of time where your opponent doesn't do anything when you're watching Workshop. So we get a lot of time to talk about Vintage. So well, not, not so fast here. Uh, it looks like Triple Sphere is going to be enough for Andreas. He says, let's go on to the next game. Yeah, honestly, I'd say it was pretty disciplined of him to have stayed in the game that long. That was, uh, that was a, a, a really tough start to beat. And, and on a... You know, that, that mulligan was a gamble, and I like it. I like the keep, but uh, sometimes your opponent is just going to have that hand. Yeah, I respect it. I don't think you can go to five five cards there against the Mana Denial deck. And it, Montoli was on the play, which is so big when in Vintage, especially with the Workshops deck. You know, your opponent doesn't have a chance to play their turn. I mean, there would have been a turn one Jace the Mind Sculptor on the other direction if he, if he had been on the draw. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that now that these players have too much cards to bring in, I could see Sorcerer Spyglass for deck fade in, and I could see possibly Precursor Golem. I'm not sure how good that card is in this matchup, though. It feels like it's more for the mirror. Yeah, I don't think I don't think Precursor Golem is in the deck for this, but I think it makes sense to bring in. Um, Andreas doesn't have too much removal that makes it scary. Get the the Grudge, the Bolt, the Reckoning, but that's it. You can't abrupt decay it. Jeez, and these are some good hands from both players. Yeah. So Andreas, turn one Ancestral Recall. Well, let's see. Is that a Mox Jet? A Mox Jet, yeah. So, yeah. so what Andreas could have done there was Vamp for Lotus and then turn one play Dak, right? That's true. Uh, Dak is 
it's maybe less good when you play it before you get to steal something. It lets yeah. Andy make sure that the first card he plays is a, a ballista or a evoker or something that stops it. That makes sense. So I think that I, I like his play of just maximizing the amount of cards, get three cards, see what I want to vamp for on, on my opponent's end step. So uh, also luckily has forced for a blue card. But Andy's going to have a pretty explosive start here with uh, Talarian Academy. He's going to be able to make four mana on turn one, uh, which would allow him to play a Walking Ballista and a Steel Overseer, I believe. Interesting which one he wants to lead with here. I think that he's going to lead with the Ballista. I don't think your opponent, I don't think people would, would force well Ballista, but maybe maybe they do and you want this overseer to resolve more often than not yeah i mean the the playing playing ballista for less than the man you have is an obvious tell we know that andy has something to follow it up um but uh but he doesn't know what it is there are so many good two drops in the deck and it's hard for andreas to know so i think I, andreas is going to vamp for energy flux here what do you think Oh, I, I agree uh this is sort of a great opening now the academy means it's not it's not game ending. Oh, but... interesting. Okay. So decided against it must be uh, waiting till the other has more information or or possibly, and while this is maybe greedy, but could be good, uh, the longer you hold on, the more cards you're going to kill with it, right? Yeah, maybe he values his own Moxon too much at this point in the game. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting, though. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. If he had played Energy Flux on that turn, wouldn't have been able to play the DAC. Goes back to his turn, can't keep the Moxes. Especially if there's a Wasteland on Andy's side, which he does have five copies of a, a Land Destruction spell. So this does going to be able to turn off the DAC Fade in. Uh, and then I, I imagine that Walking Ballista is, he's gonna probably going to play a land. He's probably going to put a counter on the Walking Ballista and then remove a counter to kill Steel Overseer is the play I see. Yeah, I like that. You obviously don't want the Overseer around too long. Walking Ballista is a multi-format all-star. I recently played this card at a, a modern Grand Prix in Los Angeles a couple weeks ago. And, and here we see him play in Vintage. He's playing in Legacy. He's played in, so play in Standard. Pretty well-designed card. Very interesting. And, you know, a callback to Triskelion, which is a favorite of many Vintage players. Uh, and it's just, it's just a good card. Combines well with, combines well with uh, Steel Overseer. We have, although it's on the wrong side of the table at this point. <laughs> I like how well it plays. Uh, it's a good card in very fair decks, and it's a good card in very unfair decks. Yes, the deck I played it in was trying to cast it for you know, a lot of mana and make a giant when I played Amulet Titan, which is trying to make you know, 20 mana and, and cast it as a 10-10. Uh, and it's also really good with Arcbound Ravager. That is another point. You talked about you know through Energy Flux, what you can do is you can Ravager, put all your counters on to walking uh, to any creature, but if it's not a Walking Ballista, you're effectively doubling its power for one turn. You can sacrifice all the counters off of it to destroy things or destroy creatures, your opponent. Um, so it looks like that Sorcerer's by Glass does name, does name Dag Faden. Andreas opts not to Force of Will, but I think he wants to save the Force of Will for you know, something that's going to be able to get him after this energy flux. And what's hard here is that even through this Wasteland, Andy knows he's getting fluxed here. There, There is one line I didn't consider before, by holding on the, the Vampiric Tutor, um, if Andreas can get Energy Flux and one of his Strip Mines or Wastelands, that's so much better here. And uh, by waiting a turn, you have a, you have a, you know, six in, six in 48 chance of drawing one of those cards um, and then being able to vamp for the other one. If he were able to get both of those in the same turn, that would, that would end the game. Um, yeah. And I missed that the player can tap for four mana with the Sorcerer Spyglass one was on the stack or in his hand. Uh, so now he gets a Wasteland as well. Uh, I think you hit the... It doesn't really matter. You know your opponent has a fetch land. Maybe you save it for Energy Flux. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the patience, patience by Andreas to see, you know, I'm going to take a few draw steps. I'm going to take a draw step on this Ancestral. I'm going to take three draws off the Ancestral and then one more draw step before I decide what to vamp for. Unfortunately, he mostly drew lands. Um, yeah, so he, there's the Energy Flux. But he really needs to find a wastelander. His one wastelander is one strip mine pretty quick here. Mm -hmm. Now the the academy doesn't doesn't totally counter the uh, the energy flux. Andy will get one mana for each of his artifacts. We'll be able to keep I don't know two thirds of them easily. Um, yeah, slow it, down a lot. It's going to be hard because the academy is going to tap for two mana, uh, and then the wasteland is going to tap for one mana. So I think. I guess the spyglass doesn't really matter anymore. So really what Andy's going to be trying to do is, is cross the finish line with this walking ballista. It's going to be pretty hard to do 
to do other anything other than that. Although, I guess Precursor Golem could could be good, but not really. I mean, Energy Flux is just so good against against Andy's deck, and he has the, the kind of the best answer he has to it, really, which is Tolarian Academy. He doesn't have any enchantment hate or artifact hate. I, there's not many that are very good. Ratchet Bomb can be hard to get up to three counters in this situation, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Andy realized to balance here, how many artifacts does he want to save versus do I want to put an extra counter on the Ballista? Do I want to leave mana up to play a threat? It's, uh, this is a tough, a tough decision. I'm not sure, sure exactly how I would play this. Yeah, I would probably, uh, look to whatever Montolio does to see how <laughs> I should play it is generally my rule of thumb. He, every time I watch him play, he does something that I would be like, well, I don't know if I would do this. I've never really played the workshop stack. I'm like, oh, that makes sense why he did this. You watch a few turns later. So Andrea's mm -hmm. going to lose his own Moxon, but he has four lands now. He doesn't really care. Oh, and there's a lightning bolt for the walking ballista. Yeah, that's that's quite good. And at 16 life, Andreas kind of has all the time, time in the world. Yeah, so Andreas, I really like Andreas's patience this game, you know. He had a lot, that's what's going to be hard about Vintage, is you kind of have an overload of options sometimes. And he had a Lotus, he had a Vampiric Tutor, and I think that he played this game really well so far and saved his Force of Will for the follow-up threat. He knew his game plan, he crafted a game plan, and he, he did it. So interestingly, he's going to kill the Walking Ballista there rather than wait for Annie to pay for it. Um, so waiting to pay the... It's possible Andy would have enough mana to add a counter to Bliss in response. Uh, I, I hadn't counted, so I'm not sure. Yeah, he had exactly uh, enough mana to keep it in at a counter. But I wonder if, I guess the time walk aspect doesn't really matter a ton. Um, because your opponent, you have an energy flux out anyways. But my thought process was that this would virtually time walk Andy because he would be spending, you know, if he chooses to make that play, he'd be spending six mana. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he's going to be able to keep basically any one card in play, you know, forever. Um, so it's on Andreas to kind of decide which, which card that's going to be. Yeah, and there's a Revoker. So this is the one unknown card Andy had in his hand. So both players have perfect information now. Andreas knows that Montelio has Precursor Golem in his hand, and they're kind of in a top deck mode here to see who, see who can draw out of this first. Although none of Andy's draws are particularly very powerful here because uh, he already has the Tolarian Academy, which is kind of the main card he wants and can only really afford to keep one threat around at a time. I guess more lands is good. Yeah, uh, because Andreas doesn't have any real gas right now, uh, like a Mistress Factory could be pretty decent, uh, a threat that doesn't, doesn't get energy fluxed. It's slow, but Andy might have time. Yeah, you, you bring up an excellent point that 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 is a great card under that's one of his answers to energy flux is the mistress factory which you know is a land on your turn the beginning of your turn and then it becomes an artifact creature so the the lowly assembly worker does a lot of work in vintage between the standstill deck and which we haven't gotten to see yet on the vintage super league it is something i've considered bringing it's a very good deck very very boring to watch is one problem with it though so i, I didn't quite want to to bust it out for the vintage super league but yeah Mistress Factory, format all-star. We're seeing so many different types of games of vintage tonight. It's like these these attrition-based matchups like you had, and we're having this here, and then I kind of got ran over with turn one, lodestone, turn two, sphere of lodestone. It's like, hopefully I get to do some running over tonight <laughs> at some point. You are You are playing the deck to do it. Yes. So it'd be interesting here. I guess, I guess Andy will have the mana to play a precursor soon, um, depending on what he draws. Precursor's not great under an energy flux, but at this point in the game, he might just be, you know, a, a like a twelve mana lightning bolt, <laughs> and that might be fine, uh, depending on how the game plays out. Oh, and there's a Snapcaster Mage who's going to be able to not only take care of this Revoker, but also start clocking. But yeah, Precursor Home is almost like a, a ball lightning or something like that. Yeah, a strangely um, slow ball lightning that deals... It costs deals double... Next turn. Quadruple the mana and deals half <laughs> as much damage, but you, you, you take what you can take in Vintage. Yeah. 
And it's great to see these cards all throughout Magic's history interacting here. You know, you have an energy flux on one side of the table. Uh, there's a Phyrexian Revoker that's getting paid more with the energy flux. And then you have other older cards like the Moxin and, and obviously broken Magic cards like Talarian Academy. One of the most powerful cards in Vintage on their restricted list for good reason. And there's a Workshop, which doesn't do much here, although I suppose it does let him cast the Precursor Golem. So this will be interesting. So what he could do is snap Vamp and then block the Revoker, which is a play I kind of like. Uh, and then you could Vamp for Jace or Ancestral. Or I guess the... Is there Ancestral an Ancestral in his graveyard? Yeah, so, so one option is to Ancestral now, and the other option is to Vamp. Looks like Andreas is going for the Vamp, um, which I think you're right. Probably means a Jace. Could... Could mean, um, well, I guess against now that this is the board, um, Jace isn't as good here. Maybe, maybe a DAC. Yeah, a second energy flux possible. That would probably lock the game up. Uh, How does DAC fade and interact with uh, Precursor Golem? So I believe Precursor is only spells, so it's not that bad. Um, yeah, it's a sorcery spell. Though, I mean, DAC would still be fine here. Um, an, an, an ancient grudge. Would uh would answer the golem and and leave a second copy behind, kind of yeah ancient grudge right there, kind of a ton. So they'll probably wait for Andy to pay for these, right? Probably that's gonna gonna buy a turn and I'm right, not waiting. It, it's probably not gonna make. Oh, it, it doesn't matter because oh, he would he would pay for him almost certainly, but I guess it doesn't really matter. You don't want to have the. The access to mana. See, I, I'm not very familiar with creatures. For those that know me, I uh, I tend to play decks with almost no creatures, or my creature might be a monastery mentor or a Xanid swarm or something. So if I'm missing any obvious interactions with creatures, get you know, get, give me a second because I, I sometimes forget to attack, I sometimes forget to block, I sometimes forget what creatures do. So let's see. That's, I think that's a, a common vintage player affliction. I've certainly certainly done the same myself plenty of times. Yes, which is where people like Montolio get their advantage, is they are very good at creatures. That's true. So both players, I guess, what really is the best good. draw here? The best draw? Um, Factory's still not bad. Well, the Ancient Grudge is there. Is there anything that stops an Ancient Grudge? Um, Graftigger's Cage, although I don't think this would be in for this sure, matchup. Sure, sure. I'm thinking more along the lines of um, if there was a hanger back walker in the deck which there isn't that would be good um uh, you know ballista like a a three three ballista wouldn't be terrible it gets grudged and then and then deals three yeah that's reasonable wow demonic tutor off the top so tutor, quite good i wonder what he gets here i guess dac is still a reasonable card yeah protects you from future threats and just really starts churning through your deck you know dac fading is a loot effect it's a, a faithful suiting uh there's even a Faithless Looting with the art. A deck vein is on the art of that card, but it's a draw two, discard two. So it doesn't create card advantage, but it finds you good cards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Looking at his list here, I wonder what he could get. Um, there's no Yawgmoth's Will. Do you have the Delve spells? No, no. Delve spells. Okay, so He already yeah. uses Ancestral and a Snapcaster Mage. So I would be inclined to get Dak here because you can play it this turn. Uh, and it, yeah, it Jace over, next turn. Yeah, over the Jace, which, yeah, like you said, Jace would be great if uh, if Andreas had another mana. Interestingly, though, here if Andreas does get a Jace, I think that Andy can put him on having gotten Jace if he doesn't cast anything, and he'll be able to wasteland plus Thorn, which I don't think would be a good play considering there's an Ancient Grudge in the graveyard. But it's something that you know something to consider. It mm -hmm. would use it would use up the Thorn, so he does get Jace. Or sorry. use up the grudge, sorry, to destroy the thorn. And I wonder if that's what's going to be what happens here. Mana Crypt paying for itself. Taps the Wasteland. Makes sense that it's Larian Academy. Rather, rather value that. And you have a... Okay, there's a Ravager, which can kind of... Can start getting in for one a turn. And then if he finds another threat, that can be kind of insulation against Ancient Grudge. Mm -hmm. He's going to play the thorn now, which I imagine... Let's get played out. I, might, I think I might ancient grudge the Ravager. Um, you don't want a thorn in play, but and he's got no cards in hand. He still cast the J. Yeah, he's not going to get wastelanded. So 
He knows he can still cast the JC. I, I think this is a fine opportunity to do so. And, and notably, you see Andreas leaving his fetch lands in play here. I see a lot of players in Vintage, they fetch to thin their deck often. But, you know, fetch lands, they don't thin your deck that much. It's one card, it's one life. Mm -hmm. But what they do is with Jason Mindsculpture's Brainstorm, the zero ability of the Planeswalker, they allow you to, which allows you to put draw three cards and put two back, they turn into a virtual Ancestral Recall because you're able to fetch away the cards that you don't want and have fresh new draws. So Andreas, I think, realizes that and wanted to maintain his fetch lines as long as possible. But now he's just going to double spell, which I think is also reasonable. Well, the... I think oh, there's a thorn. Like there I was five mana to play Jace. <laughs> which is certainly worth it. Jace Mind Sculptor, good even at five mana. <laughs> so he's just going to immediately start plussing. He figures this is his, you know, his clock. And Brainstorm's not going to do much here. He, he hasn't played a land yet, but... Best case scenario, he finds a land and casts death right. So this is also also a situation where Fate Seal is particularly good against uh, Andy. There's so many draws that he has that are are bad here <laughs> that uh, being able to filter them is better than average. I think. Yeah, there's there's not very many good cards uh, necessarily. The, the ratio of good cards to bad cards is not very high here. We have a lot of lands and moxin and lock pieces left which do virtually nothing here and you, you really care about cards like Ferex and revoker for example would be would probably be the best draw here mm -hmm. and there's one of the cards that is not very good yeah and andy understands montelio understands that once there's a sphere of resistance in play it's it's hard to kind of climb back or sorry a jason mind sculpture in play it's hard to climb back into the game So I wonder if either player's going to change anything post board. Yeah, I think Andy just brought in another Spy Glass and a Metamorph. I'm not sure what he is taking out yet. Yeah, only one Spy Glass unless I think he was considering taking it out for something else. Mm -hmm. But let's see, Null Rod's obviously not very effective here. Definitely don't want Leyline Sanctity. The only thing it really stops is Jace the Mind Sculptor's Fate Seal ability, which don't think is where you want to be. Uh, Graph Tigger's Cage. So that's one thing about sideboarding is they have a lot of cards that technically do things, but you, mm -hmm. this workshop deck- they good or they better than what you had. Exactly. This workshop deck is really built on synergy and you don't want to dilute your primary plan. All right, so interesting hand here for Andreas. One land, but he has a Brainstorm and one of his best cards in the matchup, Energy Flux. He's going to mulligan to another opening hand ancestral as well as a turn one energy flux, which is very smart of him. How do you feel about Andy mark marketing his hand? Uh, that's a, that's a that's a good hand for sure. Uh, Lotus, I mean, two ancient tombs is not ideal, but he's going to dump his hand by the second turn, really. Um, now, yeah, well, he gets to play all but one spell in his hand this turn, right? Yeah. Now we know that not having a lock piece is really going to hurt him here. Um, but... <laughs> oh, interesting. He leads on the Revoker rather than seeing what his opponent plays. I guess he feels that that is, is, is valuable enough. So I wonder what, what Andres is going to do here. A play I don't mind is just going turn one, Energy Flux, turn two, Ancestral Wasteland. Yeah, I think I think you have to do that. Um, this opportunity may not come back if, if uh, Andy draws a wasteland or a sphere. So and he's going to lose his mocks here, but you're kind of insulated from wastelands once you have an energy flux in play because the shops deck really needs to use all of its mana to pay for the the energy flux. And so we're going to see the Ravager become a large creature here. Mm -hmm. So it might he might uh, throw the counters on the inspector? I bet. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause one last would let him That's still double spell next turn if he draws another another two drop, or makes your spells cost less. Oh yeah, there it is. It's bigger too. It's going to be five damage instead of three. Oh yeah, duh. Power and toughness relevant. <laughs> now the the ancient tombs are kind of good against energy flux, but you're going to deal a lot of damage real fast. Yeah, Ancient Tomb is actually one of my favorite design cards because it's obviously broken. It, it makes mana for you know, on a land. Uh, 
But every time I play with or against Ancient Tomb, it really does feel like it's a relevant downside. Like, the damage adds up. Yeah. So Montelius is going to play both his spells here. I wonder what he's going to name with the first one, Revoker. And Dak Faden again, which is what he named the last one. That makes sense. And then... I think the first one named Black Lotus. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it did. But Dak Faden, I would say, makes even more sense now. We know that Andres doesn't have a loyalty. He would have played the last turn. Um, yeah. Time walk, good here. Well, not necessarily, because he wouldn't want to get fluxed. But... Um, yeah, he's going to be able to time walk here, which would let him hit, play a land if he draws one off this Ancestral. So what's the best draw for him here? Strip Mine? Deathbear Shaman's not bad either. Demonic yeah. Tutor this could be fine. So is this this is the time walk turn? Yeah, this is the time walk turn. Yeah, so Andreas is going to be able to play Deathrite Shaman here. And then he has Force of Will, Blue Card, and has a Demonic Tutor. Uh, next turn, he would be able to Demonic Tutor for Black Lotus and cast Jace if he would like to. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens here. I think he's going to want to find an answer to this Inspector, but even a Jace bounce on the Inspector would be kind of nice because it has he counters on it. And so putting it back down to a 3-2 is a fine place to be. He might even make the the play you hinted at before, Demonic for Strip Mine. Um, that that just that just kills the Foundry Inspector right there. Oh, yeah, especially with, with him missing a land drop here. It is tempting to be able to just play the Jace, though. But Yeah, I mean, that, that would also be a good play. Yeah, so he goes with the strip mine line. That's what's great about all these tutors is for all, with all your one ofs is, you know, a lot of decisions. But I think since he can play the second death right here, he, I think that was his draw. Is that this means that he can still cast Jace next turn. Uh, so he's going to untap with two death right shamans, an energy flux, a Jace, the mind sculptor, likely forcible backup against an opponent that's going to have zero permanence in play. So I think that Andreas is safely ahead here, really showing the power of his, his cyber plan of playing four energy fluxes. Yeah. I think that this Jace is going to prompt a concession from Montelio. <laughs> <laughs> we saw him concede to Jace last game, so we'll see this game. Jace the Mind Sculptor, better than all. Better than Dak Faden? Who knows? Maybe not. But certainly good enough this game. I, bet we I think I would brainstorm here for a... For a yeah, I'd be tempted to brainstorm for the... Um, to find a blue card, but Fate Seal gets the... Uh... Gets things rolling faster. Just because there's so many mana sources that it, it's like even if you bought a mana source, they might your opponent might find another one. But so now you get to revoker, play a revoker. Or you get to name Jace, and, and you know this isn't great here, but it turns off the turns off turns off the Jace. So yeah, buys the time. Andreas is able to gain two life and drain his opponent for two here, but is going to opt to just attack for one, which I think is fine. Yeah, he would be quite happy to trade there. Yeah. Alright. I don't I don't see a sequence of draws that could really get Montoyo back into this game, but I think he's gonna hold on to the better end. It's on a, a fairly short clock, especially if there's another black source found. Alright, I don't think I would play the Star Confidant here. What about you? Yeah, leaving up the force of will. Well you're see. leaving up the force of will, and one of the ways you lose this game is go is you know. Maybe flipping uh, two coin cards in a row with Bob. I don't know. You'd have to flip yeah. like force next turn. We got uh, plenty of cards that could do some damage there. Force of Will is also another Jace. Some three drops. Lots of three drops, actually. He's thinking about it. I'll tell you something. I think Steve Mininian would play Dark Confidant here. I don't <laughs> think he would think cards. twice about it. Greatness at any cost. Yeah. Even the game. Great, the great one himself. In in the Vintage Super League, in fact. No longer, but True. this season was. I I remember uh, Bob Mar played in a Vintage Champs a few years back. Um, that was an amazing Vintage Champs. The the finals was uh, Bob Mar versus Owen Turtenwald with a like a 75-card mirror. Um, this was probably Dark, Dark Confidence's best time in Vintage. It was a J-Star Confidant deck that was popular at the time. And they, I just heard so many stories over the course of the day of him beating people with Bob, Bob killing him, him playing against someone, and Confidant killed them. And they're just like, Bob killed me with Bob. It was my own Bob. It was it was a hilarious day <laughs> just to watch yeah, every a, game he played. There's a relatively well-known clip of, of of Bob Marr losing the game to Dark Confidant triggering and <laughs> and, and losing the game, which is which is pretty funny. But what did you do? 
in my opinion, second place is the best place at uh, Turn Weekend. I think that is the, the the pinnacle. You don't get the painting, but you get to uh, remember how you almost won every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this game is locked up. It looks like Andreas is going to get this one. And uh, Energy Flux, too powerful. Yeah, Energy Flux got there. And we we I think we saw how it could have gone wrong. He was close to being able to handle Flux, but not close enough. I mean, yeah, I mean, Andreas had his... I mean, he did have a tutor, but he had his... One Wasteland, his one Strip Mine, and his Cyborg card. So it's like, really showing the power of Tutors is that he was able to, to look for exactly what he wanted those games. Vampiric Tutor found the Energy Flux. Interestingly, the Vampiric Tutor is in Andreas' Cyborg. So I think he's bringing it in in matchups where he feels the Energy Flux is really important. Which is, yeah. a, I haven't seen yeah, that, that before. Um, it's not necessarily so good against a deck with a lot of counter spells. Uh, certainly not mental missteps. Um, but against something like Workshops, where you're, you're trying to find one one card as fast as you can um makes sense yeah the two life is relevant but oftentimes it's going to be pay two life virtually win the game which i think is an i think a lot of people are willing to make that trade uh in magic you're, you're willing to make that trade you have thought season in your deck which sometimes is pay two life win the game so yeah <laughs> and, and sometimes sometimes the opposite uh yeah i uh Vampire Tutor can also, I, I think in this side, where it kind of acts as like a virtual extra card, right? Um, against uh, a dredge deck, kind of an extra dredge hate spell uh, without having to dedicate an extra card for that, uh, which is. Yeah, so you and I are going to be facing off next, I believe. And we're going to cut to ads now and come back and you'll get to see some more sweet vintage action.